Okay, this is the ankle foot lecture. I'm going to start with a little anatomy review of the ankle. And if you had to pick one bone, that's probably the most important bone in the ankle joint complex. It's probably going to be the talus. Um, mainly because if you look at that chart, what you can see is it's going to articulate not only with the tibia, but it articulates with the calcaneus and the navicular. So putting those two together, the talus and the tibia, you have what we usually refer to as the talocural joint, giving us dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. When it articulates with the calcaneus, we have the subtalar joint, inversion and eversion is the motion produced there. And then finally, with its articulation with the navicular or talonavicular joint, we're going to get foot supination and pronation. As far as muscles go, um, you're going to really see, especially in the ankle joint, that most movements do not have uh, just one muscle producing that action. So I've put a little check mark by kind of what we would consider to be the primary muscle responsible for producing those motions. But when you invert the ankle, so you're inverting at that subtalar joint, it's going to be combined with supination. And so if you look at muscles involved, tibialis posterior, it's your primary one to help you with inversion. But the tibialis anterior, the flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, is also going to be involved with that inversion motion. Opposite would be the eversion. And when you evert the foot, it should be, I'm sorry, evert the ankle, it should be combined with pronation of the foot. Pronus longus, definitely your primary muscle to give you that eversion, but you've got your little pronus brevis, pronus tertius, and the extensor digitorum longus. That's going to help with that as well. Finally, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsiflexure is coming primarily from the tibialis anterior, but your pronus muscles, your extensor digitorum longus, sensor hallucis longus, also going to help with dorsiflexion of the ankle joint. And then finally, plantar flexion. You've got gastroc soleus, of course, but don't forget about plantaris, that muscle that just has the longest tendon possible. And then tibialis posterior is also going to help in the movement of plantar flexion. Major ligaments, um, they're best classified just saying whether they're lateral or medial. And if you remember from back in kinesiology, you've got your anterior, your posterior, talofibular, and then your calcaneofibular ligament. Out of those three lateral ligament uh, structures, the anterior talofibular hands down is the most common site of an ankle sprain. Most ankle sprains occur on the lateral side. Um, not that you can't sprain medial ligaments, it's just not going to be very common. Less than 5% usually of ankle sprains are going to be involving that deltoid ligament. It's a lot thicker, a lot bigger band, and we're a lot more likely to roll that ankle um, into that mechanism of plantar flexion and inversion than we are to sprain an ankle going into dorsiflexion and eversion. So we'll talk a little bit later about the mechanism of injury with that too. Okay, just kind of a listing there of other joints and ligaments to not forget about. Some of this will come back to us as we talk about specific injuries or structure problems in the foot and things like that. But looking at the intertarsal joints, tarsal, metatarsal, calcaneocuboid joints, um, you've got, of course, your metatarsal phalanges, your interphalangeal joints, flexion and extension. The syndesmotic ligament, um, I'm thinking you guys referred to it by that term, um, it really is kind of a funny structure to be called a ligament because obviously its job is to hold the tibia and the fibula together. And so um, we'll talk about that, especially when we talk about um, conditions known as high ankle sprains. And then finally, the spring ligament, which definitely gives people a little bit more arch support. And then, of course, on the bottom of the foot, you've got your long and your short plantar ligaments. So just a few other structures in there to kind of keep in mind. We've got thick layers of a lot of small muscles on the bottom of the foot. And uh, we definitely see a lot of issues with foot position, with a lot of excessive pronation in the foot. And when you have that, you definitely have um, structures like your ligaments and your spring ligament being affected and being stretched out. Okay, so we're going to go right into ligament injuries of the ankle. And like I said, that lateral complex is definitely the most common area. And in fact, um, ankle sprains are the most common sports type of injury. Um, they usually say that about 
of all ankle sprains occur to that lateral complex, to the lateral ligament, with definitely the anterior talofibular being the most common. Um, but the posterior talofibular and the calcaneal fibular can also be involved when you have a sprain. Uh, a lot of times it's simple things, even in your non-athletic population, stepping off a curb, kind of missing that last step, walking in the yard, didn't realize there was a big uh, type of hole in the yard that um, some critter had dug or something like that. And so a lot of times the ankle just kind of rolls, and it really rolls into that inversion motion as well as plantar flexion causing a sprain of those lateral ligaments. So plantar flexion and inversion, the forefoot is actually adducted when going into that mechanism of injury for the ankle. There's a good picture and that would be anterior talofibular. Um, just like I said, that's going to be the most common sprain, but you're definitely going to have patients that sprain two of the three, three of the three, and you know the grading of the ligament sprains is the same as what we've been talking about all along as far as grade one, grade two, and grade three. This one obviously would be a grade three because it is a full tear. That would be all three involved. So you have your anterior talofibular, your calcaneal fibular, and then your posterior talofibular ligament there. That would be a pretty significant lateral complex ankle sprain if you had a grade three to all three ligaments. Okay, lots of swelling and bruising is very common um, initially after an ankle sprain. Now, if you have like a grade one where you just basically kind of roll the ankle a little bit, you tweak it, um, you know, just your very small tears, just kind of an overstretching of, of the involved ligament. A grade one, you're not going to see a whole lot of appreciable swelling and, and, or bruising. Um, but when you get into the grade two and the grade three, not only are you going to have a little bit more um, pain that's severe, but you're definitely going to have more swelling and bruising that occurs in that lateral ankle complex. The test that we'll be doing in class is an anterior drawer, which, you know, you've heard that term before when we talked about anterior drawer of the knee. Um, but there's also a Taylor tilt test, and with grade three or full tears of that lateral complex, that's where you're definitely going to see um, a positive Taylor tilt test. And, and I'll show you those tests as far as really being able to look specifically at each of the three ligaments of the lateral side of the ankle. When you're looking at grades one and two, it's all about the rehab, and a lot of your grade one patients won't even show up in rehab with you to, um, you know, go through therapy for that grade one. A lot of times they just kind of heal on their own. It's not enough to injure the person. The problem is that if they re-sprain while they're still on the mend from that grade one, they can continue to have more sprains. They could have like a grade two or even possibly a grade three. Um, but by the time you have a grade three, usually for most patients, surgery is going to be indicated because you're really looking at a very unstable ankle. That would be your example of significant lateral swelling and significant bruising. That would be a pretty severe inversion sprain, but I thought that was a good picture because it really, really shows you how hot and swollen and definitely very tender to palpation this, this patient would be. Okay, so going just to the grade one and two, uh, you're looking at, and we like to term that max protection phase. In other words, we're really protecting the area that needs to heal. We've got to get rest ice compression elevation in there, even three to five times per day, icing it, elevating it. Um, you know, a lot of people will say an ace bandage is the best. Uh, we really could look at taping it, but a lot of times that's difficult to do when the ankle is still really swollen. Uh, if you go, if you sprain your ankle pretty significantly and you go to the emergency room, they're probably going to give you an air splint. I'll pull one of those out in class, just a simple little ankle one. Um, the good types of braces actually will position the ankle in slight dorsiflexion and eversion. So if you think about it, all that's doing is getting the ankle out of the mechanism of injury. The last thing that we would want to do at this early stage is to do plantar flexion and inversion with the patient. As far as modalities go, sometimes that contrast bath can be really good shock to the system and help with uh, the management of all the swelling that will be going on in there. Pulsed ultrasound, more than likely you want to do that underwater. And then possibly e-stem, although not hugely indicated usually when it comes to ankle sprains. Most grade one and twos, um, 
like I said, grade ones, might not even ever see them, might not even go to any doctor or get a referral, go to therapy, anything like that. But definitely your grade twos, um, you still want these patients to be weight-bearing as tolerated. So use an assistive device. They're going to start with real simple isometrics like dorsiflexion and eversion, um, moving into active range of motion, but at least initially, avoid that mechanism of injury. So avoid plantar flexion and inversion um, and combining those two movements specifically when you're doing active range of motion exercises. If this is an athlete and you're trying to maintain their cardiac fitness level, you can be working on that and strengthening of other areas, uh, especially if it is a sports related injury. Um, but in the early stages, it's, it's really all about protection of that ankle. There would be the example of the air splint brace. Those are pretty generic. They're just kind of off the shelf. Some people will call them a stirrup brace. Um, you can see that the support is there on the lateral side. Sometimes they're even universal, so they would work for a medial sprain too. There's support both on the lateral and the medial side in most brands of them. Um, it really doesn't do a whole lot, but it does kind of check that motion of the ankle so that it's less likely that the patient will uh, be able to roll the ankle again while they're wearing it. As we move into moderate protection phase, what you're probably going to see most of all is that the swelling is going to go down quite a bit. Um, at this point, besides continuing with the rest ice compression elevation, we could still do things like friction massage over that sprained ligament. Um, you guys remember doing that in massage class. That is a great, great intervention to help with the healing of these structures since it is ligamentous soft tissue um, fibers that, that we're dealing with. That's perfect for friction massage. We can now progress to strengthening. Um, a lot of times you'll start with something simple like what we call the ankle alphabet. So they can move that ankle into all ranges of motion as long as pain is minimal to none um, when going into plantar flexion and um, inversion especially. So start adding that in as they're tolerating it. Um, if they haven't already, they should be weaned from the assistive device. So whether they were using crutches, a walker, um, go down to either you know a, a less restrictive device like one crutch or a cane, um, but definitely want to move to full weight bearing. Then we can begin strengthening concentrically and eccentrically. Don't forget about stretching the ankle. Um, the Achilles tendon can get really, really tight in patients, especially if they had been very protected and just, you know, gingerly stepping that foot down and not putting a whole lot of weight on it. It can be very, very tight. And then we can start on some closed chain stuff. So you can start bilateral and then work your way to single limb activities. Okay. Finally then, make sure, and, and this is where, again, if therapy cuts off or the patient doesn't come to therapy at this point, but we haven't worked on uneven surfaces or doing a lot of single leg stuff, um, or if you have an athlete and you haven't gotten back to shooting hoops, doing layups, running, jumping, sidestepping, all that good stuff and drills, depending on their sport, they're going to be uh, very likely to re-sprain. We already know that ligaments don't have the best blood supply. So um, if we don't get them to these end stages of rehab, getting into those plyometrics and things like that, if it's appropriate for that patient, um, they're going to be at very high risk of re-spraining it again. They might still at this stage have some taping done or um, wearing a brace. First time that you introduce a lot of closed chain things, you may want the patient to be taped or braced and then gradually wean them out of that as they tolerate a little bit more. So again, looking at, there's a difference in that 22-year-old who wants to get back to, you know, playing weekend softball tournaments versus that 58-year-old who, you know, likes to walk and roll their ankle. You know, we still want to get them to the end stages of rehab, but some of the things like isokinetics and plyometrics might not necessarily be appropriate in those cases. Okay, so if there is surgery, which would typically be with a grade three, um, there's going to be a lot of immobilization. It can be a pretty slow recovery, but when you think about either suturing the ligament, um, it's going to tighten it up. So getting that range of motion back is definitely the first order of business. Um, when you think about what a patient will and will not be able to do, there might be some specific precautions, protocols, depending on the approach that the surgeon uses. Um, but it's definitely going to have the same sort of progression as what we talked about for non-operative management of the grade one and two. But you're going to probably have to progress at a lot slower rate. And you may have 
weight-bearing restrictions right from the get-go after surgery. Okay, so that was all lateral complex. Much more important to think about that just because it is so much more common, but if you took everything I said about mechanism of injury, et cetera, and you just completely reverse that, that's what we'd be talking about with a medial compartment or a deltoid ligament sprain. Um, they're going to usually occur when there's some other kind of injury. So the person fractures their malleolus, um, so they have a medial malleolus fracture or a trimalleolar fracture or a bimalleolar fracture, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And at the same time that they have the fracture, they actually have a deltoid ligament sprain. Um, and again, any grade one, two, or three. A lot of times your posterior tibialis muscle kind of has dysfunction when it comes to that deltoid ligament sprain, and so we have to watch that when it comes to the rehab. But your treatment is going to be pretty similar to what we just said with the lateral, except for your mechanism of injury was dorsiflexion with eversion. So those are the motions that you're going to avoid right from the get-go. So if you're going to be taped, you're going to be taped to the opposite that you would be to the lateral complex. And again, just depending on are they going to be immobilized for a while, if it's a grade three, um, are they going to do surgical repair will just depend on the patient and depend on kind of what the overall outcomes need to be for them. Okay, so just in what we talked about, which of the following interventions is used in the initial management phase of an acute inversion ankle sprain? And so with that one, all the time, you're looking at weight bearing as tolerated. Okay, that's hands down. They typically will just say, put as much weight as you can tolerate on it, but use an assistive device. There usually is never going to be, hey, don't weight bear at all, hop around, and there's never usually going to be orders saying partial weight bearing for a while. Okay, obviously D, you can get rid of that, because if that's coming around the pike for your patients at rehab, that's going to be very late stage in the game. Here's another good boards question. Just, we haven't talked about this yet, but I wanted you to think about it. It says, the skier's ankle is forced into dorsiflexion, and the structures supporting the ankle are injured. So we've just talked about the mechanism of injury for the lateral, for the medial complex. Um, so you know that neither one of those is just forced dorsiflexion. But it says, which injury has likely occurred and which test would be diagnostic for the injury? So for one thing, even if you thought deltoid, an x-ray is not going to show whether you have a ligament sprain. So get rid of A. Okay, you, that leaves you with B, C, and D. Okay, get rid of D because it has, you have no ability to know what grade we're talking about. So there's, there's no way to answer D because we can't say just by the information we were given that it would be a full tear. So that leaves B and C doesn't mention anything about inversion. And so what we're actually dealing with here would be what is called a high ankle sprain, which actually involves the syndesmotic ligament. And we'll be showing in, you in class, you'll be doing in class the squeeze test. So the correct answer for this one is B. It would be a high ankle sprain, which unfortunately is a lot harder and longer to rehab than inversion or eversion sprains. Okay, there's a picture of it. So some people call it the syndes syndesmotic ligament. Some people call it just the syndesmosis. But it definitely is the structure that's a little strange because it's what's holding the tibia and the fibula together. And so when we say that someone had a high ankle sprain, it is an injury to that syndesmotic ligament or syndesmosis. Um, it doesn't mean that the patient might not have also sprained other ligaments around the ankle, so it could be associated with lateral especially since that's more common. But usually the ankle goes into excessive dorsiflexion. Um, it's in a weight-bearing position. And a lot of times it's dorsiflexion that's kind of forced along with some rotation and twisting that occurs. So most often this is you're watching, you know, NFL Sunday, and this is when you see someone gets injured. And when you hear that it's a high ankle sprain, um, I will usually say to my husband, that's a season ender because it's, it's just a tough, tough thing to rehab through, especially if it's a pretty significant sprain. Okay. They will have pain that's higher, hence the term high ankle sprain. Um, it's going to be more anterior, usually just above the ankle. But the nice thing about the squeeze test is you can start all the way proximal to distal or vice versa and kind of get a feel for where most of the pain is as to where that sprain is going to be. So that the test that we'll do in class is called the squeeze test. They're also probably going to have quite a bit of swelling. 
um, typically bruising throughout the lower leg, that would be indicative of a high ankle sprain as well. Okay, if it is a full or a severe tear, um, and I've seen these sometimes classified as like grade three, but not as often as what you would grade like your lateral or your medial ankle sprains or knee sprains and that type of thing. But if it is unstable, um, obviously something needs to be there to connect those two bones together nicely, um, then surgery would probably be indicated. They'll actually do an open reduction internal fixation. But if it seems like a pretty stable um, sprain or it's just a partial, then they'll usually just get immobilization for a while. So they'll just be put in a cast. Um, that way you don't have a lot of ankle motion going on. Uh, but definitely weight bearing is probably going to be restricted for even up to three months. And your progression is going to be similar as what we talked about for the medial and the lateral sprains, but it's definitely going to be a slower uh, rate of, of how you can progress this patient. So, you know, think about the structure involved. We'll go back to that picture. It's huge compared to the ligaments that we're talking about in the ankle area. So it can be definitely an injury that you don't want to hear somebody has because it's, it's just a lot harder to rehab than your regular lateral or medial complex ligament sprains. Okay. So what can happen sometimes with people when they end up kind of re-spraining or having several ankle sprains is that they basically get very chronically unstable in that ankle joint. And so, you know, what will follow with that is going to be weakness of the muscles around the foot and the ankle joint, kind of constant swelling or low-grade swelling that can occur, chronic pain, um, and even osteoarthritis beginning to settle its way into the ankle joint. And so typically for enough instability, they will um, oftentimes recommend surgery. And that might be like a rerouting of the peroneus brevis muscle to kind of stabilize the lateral ankle. Or they may even go in and those ligaments that have been re-sprained and re-sprained over time, they need to tighten them up. So they may do a little bit of a resection, shorten them, reattach them. This is going to be kind of a long haul for treatment as well. You're going to have immobilization. Um, you can see anything from just a couple of weeks to even a couple of months um, in some patients, but it will depend on the protocol of that, of that ortho surgeon for sure as far as what the immobilization would be like. Okay, overuse injuries of the ankle or the foot. So what you'll see a lot of times with the ankle and the foot itself is we get lots of what we would call repetitive microtrauma. So in other words, we're doing activities that are producing some kind of trauma throughout the soft tissues, but we're doing it repetitively. So Achilles tendonitis, tendinosis is probably the best example of all of that. So many times with your Achilles issues, um, causes can range from aging, Obviously, it can occur with, with more wear and tear on the ankle joint. But um, in the actual tendinosis, collagen is actually being degenerated. And that's, that's a little bit different than just your, your tendinitis or looking at it more as an acute inflammation. But the problem with these overuse injuries is that the person just chronically is doing damage to it. Sometimes it can be you've got an athlete and that's the way that they're training. Um, perhaps there's some muscle imbalances. It's, it's pretty common for gastroc soleus or one or both of those to be very, very tight. You can have patients that are very, very developed in their uh, gastroc soleus, but anteriorly, that tibialis anterior is just weak as can be or very weak as compared to the gastroc soleus. It's a much smaller muscle, so obviously we can't be as strong in it as we can in the gastroc soleus complex, but um, many times this might be patients that wear pretty poor footwear, whether they're, it's, it's in a sport, they're not wearing the right type of shoes. You know, a good example is somebody who pronates. And when you have foot pronation and you don't wear footwear, especially athletic footwear that is designed for the pronator, you're setting yourself up for a world of hurt and, and you could really do damage to your foot and your ankle. So someone that has Achilles problems, Achilles tendonitis, would be they do their activity, they do their sport, or they're up on their feet all day, and this is when it really begins to bother them. They're usually going to complain of pain kind of in that lower one-third um, gastroc 
sort of Achilles tendon area, but usually at least from mid muscle belly and then distal, um, but even down into pinpoint tenderness or a lot of tenderness right on that Achilles tendon where it inserts into the calcaneus can also be a, a pretty prime symptom of Achilles tendonitis. When you resist plantar flexion, because you're resisting muscle involved, it's going to be painful. So you have that resisted pain or the opposite. When you stretch the plantar flexors, you may elicit pain from the patient. They might also have a little bit of low grade swelling or inflammation in that uh, ankle or right around the calcaneal area, but it's pretty um, common. And, and one of the best things you can do too is take a look bilaterally and kind of see what foot position is because this is probably a person who may be excessively pronates. It could be a patient who has pretty flat feet, who's lost their arch. And so a lot of times we really have to look at what are the feet doing in the first place that might have brought this on or it could be an issue from up above it could be that they have some knee issues that has changed their foot position and, and so um, we really have to look up and down the chain to kind of figure out what might be going on with the patient okay nothing should really look that different to you for treatment than kind of the things we've talked about second point on there though the heel lift so when you have someone that's pretty tight in their gastroc soleus, a lot of times putting a stretch on it is going to bother the patient. So sometimes, at least initially, use a heel lift in the shoe, and that will take a little bit of stress off that tendon. And then that heel lift could be decreased over time as their symptoms improve and as they gain more flexibility both in the gastroc and the soleus. Uh, modalities like ultrasound, Phonophoresis or even iontophoresis might not be a bad idea. It's, it's a real specific, um, nicely uh, accessible tendon to get to, so those can work really well. That ultrasound might have to be done underwater. Uh, flexibility, typically you're tight both gastroc soleus, maybe not, could be one over the, over the other that's a little bit tighter. We want to really strengthen dorsiflexion, okay? Eccentric strengthening is important too. When you think about something like running downhill, when you run downhill, that eccentric control at the ankle is so important for those patients. And so when you do eccentric strengthening of the ankle, that's just huge when it comes to rehabbing from ankle injuries in general, but especially Achilles tendonitis. Because remember, a lot of times part of the problem is those dorsiflexors are pretty weak. Okay, definitely look at what the patient's wearing and see, you know, we're not shoe experts. We don't work for a company or anything like that, but obviously if they are a pronator and they're not wearing shoes made for that, that could definitely be a problem for that patient. Okay, moving along just to the bottom of the foot, we're going to talk about plantar fasciitis. And with this, you don't always have to have a heel spur, but we know a spur is an overgrowth of bone. People that have the heel spur are definitely going to be more likely to be pretty symptomatic, but it's that whole plantar aponeurosis area that is undergoing basically repetitive trauma again, similar to the Achilles tendon, only we're talking bottom of the foot as far as that uh, fascial pain that we're feeling or the patient is feeling. They will usually have pain all the way from their heel to their MTP joints. Um, a lot of times it's kind of medial calcaneal area that they're having pain. And sometimes you'll have patients that have a little bit of both. They've got plantar fasciitis going on and they've got a little Achilles tendonitis at the same time. Um, but your plantar fasciitis, you'll also tend to have pain um, when you go into dorsiflexion and even when that great toe is extended a little bit. So you're putting a quite a stretch on the bottom of that foot and it can be oftentimes very even tender to touch or you'll get to the heel and you go to palpate and they are just as tender as could be on the bottom of the foot. Typically, because it's painful along that area, a lot of times their gait becomes very flat-footed. So they come down into um, initial contact, and rather than it being a nice heel-toe progression with their gait, they come down, no heel strike, foot flat. The only thing that's going to do is continue to make gastroc soleus a little bit tighter. And um, with a lot of these patients, they'll also say to you that the pain is at its very worst in the morning. Uh, think about how you sleep, think about the feet being in a relaxed position, ankles in plantar flexion, and so when you first get up over the edge of the bed and you're going to stand up, 
you are putting such a stretch on the bottom of those feet that have been potentially for seven, eight hours, if you don't have to get up in the night, um, just in that plantar flex position, tightening of all of the plantar muscles on the bottom of the foot. And so usually that first initial standing up in the morning, taking a few steps, getting going can be extremely painful when it comes to plantar fasciitis. Some conservative treatment, um, and your foot doctors would say, you know, surgery might be indicated, but when you're looking at conservative treatment, um, definitely look at the footwear of these patients. High-heeled shoes are probably one of the worst things that you can do as far as wearing um, when you have plantar fasciitis. Not only that, but it leads to, you know, a host of other problems, low back pain, et cetera. Sometimes arch taping can help. You guys will do some taping next semester. Uh, what feels really good to these patients is cold ice packs. So an ice massage can work nicely. Sometimes one of the best things you can do is um, freeze like a water bottle. And then not only can the patient use that sort of to give themselves a little massage, but they're doing exercises for their toes and their ankle while rolling that frozen bottle on the floor. So that, that's kind of a nice exercise to do and cheap and easy for anybody to manage at home. Gastroxoleus stretching for sure, uh, modalities. Uh, don't forget about toes. A lot of times we think this is just the foot problem and the ink kind of the ankle problem being tight but honestly we really need to work on toe exercises working on the extrinsic and I'm sorry intrinsic muscles of the foot um, I'll put towels on the floor have a patient kind of crunch them up um, marbles things like that so that they really work on toe curling to work on plant or toe flexion strength but also to stretch those out too we can't forget about the toes our toes are so important for our balance and a lot of times with older patients population who get plantar fasciitis, that's one of the first things that you start noticing is a, is a change in their balance too. So having good healthy foot muscles, ankle, range of motion that's normal can only enhance balance. Okay, strengthen those dorsiflexors. And then a lot of times because of those patients that say, oh, the morning is the worst, I can hardly, you know, get up in the morning first thing. I'd educate them to try to get up in the night and stretch out a little bit if that's possible. Um, otherwise, you can actually get splints that they can wear at night and that those will keep the ankles more in a neutral position so that you're not just in a plantar flexed position all night long. Okay. Your foot doctors or even some of your MDs will tend to want to do steroid injections. Those can provide at least some temporary relief for patients. If conservative treatment, everything that you've done in therapy just doesn't seem to be helping the patient, which most of the time it's going to help them quite a bit, but if conservative treatment fails or if this is a pretty nasty heel spur, they will actually go in and they'll either take out that heel spur or they may do a fasciotomy, release the tight structures, plantar fascia release. Um, studies have been out there for the PRPs, the platelet-rich plasma injections. Um, I think the studies are all over the place, whether these actually help with plantar fasciitis or not. Okay. Okay, medial tibial stress syndrome is the next uh, lower leg condition that I want to talk about. This is also an overuse injury. Um, it involves primarily the posterior tibialis, though, and that medial portion of the soleus. Um, a lot of times you actually get inflammation uh, periosteal-wise at the muscle attachments. And so that makes this kind of hard to treat when you think about the depth of that muscle tissue and where a lot of that inflammation is. Um, this is hands down usually your pronators. So people that excessively promate, pronate, have muscle imbalance, lots of flexibility issues. It might even be brought upon by somebody who decides to try a new activity, a new sport, um, and they, especially using the ankle musculature eccentrically. I've had people who um, think that, okay, I can run the Bix, I haven't really trained, I haven't ran the course, but I'm going to go in and I'm going to do a great job and I, you know, I'm going to get a sub 50 on it. And they find that that eccentric control that's required in the downhill, especially going down Brady Street Stadium, um, at the end of the race, practically that last mile can really bring about a lot of issues in the lower legs. And, you know, that just requires such eccentric control that um, a lot of times people are just sore for a long time after that race. Okay. Um, like we said, it's pronation. Typically, pain goes distally and usually mid-tibia. 
um, kind of posterior border more often, but can also be anterior medial, medial border. They're going to be pretty tender to palpation. You can kind of come in from the side medially, and you'll just find tender spots, especially along that soleus area. Um, so they're definitely going to complain of a lot of tenderness and a lot of soreness in that lower leg, and, and mainly medially would help you know that, that we're talking about medial tibial stress syndrome. So I'm going to go right into anterior tibial periostitis, which um, I just like to usually refer to as shin splints. And it kind of used to be the idea that shin splints were shin splints, whether it was posterior medial stress syndrome or whether it was this anterior tibial periostitis. Um, but they really kind of almost have separate causes, although treatment is going to be pretty similar for both. So we're not going to talk about treatment yet, but let me tell you a little bit about the anterior tibial periostitis or the shin splints. It's also an overuse syndrome, but now we've kind of gone opposite to what muscles are affected. So it's anterior tib and it's extensor halicus longus quite often. That picture there I think does a good job of showing where the pain area would be. And so anterior wise, when you look at that, we, we kind of consider that to be shin splints. Anymore, you'll still have people that say you could have posterior shin splints, but more uh, sources now kind of separate those two and, and really only call the anterior to be true um, what we say are shin splints. Um, causes oftentimes mechanical, poor conditioning, um, improper training methods. All of a sudden we've gone from, you know, running on indoor surfaces to we're running outdoors, we're doing cross country, that type of thing. Um, you know, just sudden, sudden change in training habits can always bring about uh, things like shin splints too. So the tenderness and the soreness is going to be in that anterior compartment. So kind of laterally, right over the shin bone, anterior tibialis, since that's an affected muscle, might be a little bit painful with resisted toe extension of the great toe just because of the EHL involvement that we see too. Okay, so treatment-wise, um, there's really probably nothing on there new that you haven't seen before, but you really have to do a correction of tight muscles Again, whatever that is, anterior or posterior, strengthen whatever muscle groups are weak, which again, oftentimes in some patients is all of the above. If they are a severe pronator, it may be that orthotics are indicated, not only special shoes, but looking at um, using some type of orthotic to help with that. And then, you know, taking a look at training methods too. You just get people that sometimes just do whatever they want, they don't listen to their body and they want to get right back out there to their activity or their event before they're actually healed. And this is where we can really, you know, see that the patient is going to have chronic issues with this. A lot of times though, like your younger population, they'll get this um, when they do start a new sport and especially the anterior, the what we would generally refer to as shin splints. And those are usually pretty um, easily treatable. They'll, they'll improve quite quite rapidly in the younger population especially. Okay, talking about stress fractures next. And with stress fractures, um, we basically have what we would consider to be a partial or an incomplete fracture. It's a lot of times caused by repetitive stress or force, but it could be an actual traumatic event that causes it. Um, if you are running on a stress fracture, walking on a stress fracture, um, you just aren't allowing that bone to heal because it's undergoing that constant uh, stress, you know, every time that you do that activity or walk in those certain shoes or go running in hiking boots or that type of thing. So common sites would be metatarsals as well as the lateral malleolus. And you'll also a lot of times see stress fractures right along the tibial crest too. Symptoms when it comes to stress fractures is that pain gets worse when they do the activity, gets better when they're at rest, they take a few days off, feels a lot better, okay, I think I can get back to running again, um, only to have that pain begin to increase right after they start their activity again. There will be usually pain over bony prominences. It's, it, it can sometimes be a little bit of a deep palpation that can elicit pain, but usually the patient with a stress fracture can hone right away into where is uh, this pain when you ask them to, to point out you know, the activity that's primarily affected. A lot of times it can mimic shin splints, especially those anterior uh, ones that we talked about. And in that, when that's the case, we really have to look more at 
the symptoms that the patient is feeling and whether they're tender more bone wise or whether they're tender more muscle wise and that can kind of help um, with figuring out is this could this possibly be a stress fracture there would be a couple of good locations where you'll see it just kind of mid shaft of the tibia and then another common site is going to be right over that fifth metatarsal there on the lateral border of the foot okay as far as treatment goes though got to let that patient rest okay they might wear a specific walking splint or a boot that will offload that area where the stress fracture is they could do exercises that are non weight bearing at first for that lower extremity um, typically range of motion isn't um, contraindicated but we'll progress with strengthening and flexibility as the healing occurs if a person can get in a pool and do some aquatic therapy what a great way to work the extremity without getting that weight bearing um, for the patient so that that can work really well ultrasound would obviously be not a modality of choice you do an ultrasound over an area of a stress fracture and they are going to have intense severe pain that's for sure uh, oh and I forgot to mention we will use another way that you can kind of diagnose a stress fracture without an x-ray or a series of x-rays would be using a tuning fork so we'll actually do I'll do a demonstration of that in class Okay, just like other weight-bearing joints of the body, the ankle itself can have what we would call capsular restrictions. So I just kind of lumped in a few different diagnoses that we may see that can affect the ankle joint. Um, RA can definitely affect the ankle, although what we typically see is it's more the feet and the toes that could end up with RA conditions affecting those joints. Osteoarthritis tends to affect the ankle joint. Uh, one of the, the things that's being replaced, not to a huge degree, um, the outcomes just aren't quite there like hip and knee replacement, but the ankle can actually undergo a total ankle, or, I'm sorry, total ankle replacement. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Gout itself is a disorder of too much uric acid in the body. And what's weird about gout is it can affect the ankle, but a lot of times where it lodges and rears its ugly head is going to be the MTP of the great toe. So that toe will be hot, red, swollen, uh, very painful to get flexion, extension in, and those are possible signs and symptoms of gout when you see it in that great toe. We also might have people that earlier in life fractured the ankle or fractured the foot and end up with some types of capsular restrictions or end up with um, post-traumatic arthritis later on in life when they've had um, that type of fracture or even had an ORAF of the ankle and that type of thing. Some symptoms when we do have any of those conditions with capsular restrictions present would be swelling, um, range of motion begins to be decreased, pain is often much worse when it comes to weight bearing in those patients um, they're just saying this is bothering me I don't walk as far as I used to it hurts when I walk or I'm really sore later um, I, you know I won't be able to sleep tonight if I do too much on my feet and the problem is that the foot is going to kind of mold into a position of comfort so you might end up getting some types of foot deformities patient walks a little bit more supinated pronated um, they walk flat footed because ankle is tightened up and they don't quite have the dorsiflexion or the plantar flexion that they need and when you add in comorbidities and I'm going to mention two and that would be diabetes and then any kind of peripheral vascular disease this can only make this condition worse because we're talking about pretty distal circulation here into the toes into the feet into the ankle and so both of those conditions might result in very poor blood supply to the lower leg and so those definitely make things a lot worse for those patients the other thing with diabetes to consider is you may be looking at patients who already have abnormalities in their feet like a Charcot foot um, those are things that you, you probably have heard before we won't really talk about them till next semester when we talk about wounds but a lot of your patients with vascular disease or diabetes can be um, very susceptible to developing pressure points abnormally on different points of their feet or they have huge calluses causing abnormal pressure points and those will really um, make a condition of, of any kind of arthritis or limited range of motion in the ankle even much worse.
just kind of listed capsular restrictions and some ideas there. Um, shoe and footwear, I, I put that last on the list, but that's probably the most important thing that you can do. These patients should not walk around barefoot. These patients should have good footwear. Uh, many times good shoes can be covered under insurance plans. Um, that's one thing Medicare and Medicaid do very well is that they will provide shoes for people who need them, especially for diabetics uh, with the right documentation. But when you have any kind of capsule restriction in the ankle, you know, maybe unweight it using an assistive device, maybe put the person in a pool. Um, if you can do balance and proprioception, if weight bearing isn't painful, that's great to do because it's going to be a great method of fall prevention in those patients, but definitely nothing high impact, not lots of jumping, one-legged things on that affected limb. That's just going to be too much for these types of patients. Okay, that brings us to total ankle replacement, which like I said, just does not quite have the um, notoriety as your hip, your knee, and even your shoulder replacements, um, the success rate in those. It's not that ankle replacements have poor rates of success, but they do tend to have difficulty with rehab for a lot of these patients. The surfaces that are replaced is going to be the tibia and the, and the Taylor surfaces. So you're not involving the navicular, calcaneus, anything like that. This is true joint that allows us dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Um, so if you have somebody with just severe disabling ankle pain, um, this could even be somebody who had multiple, multiple fractures. Um, leg basically got caught in a lawnmower, that type of thing. So the ankle itself, very unstable. Too many repair areas would be needed. Sometimes um, when the tibia and the talus are the most affected, it's going to be the most important to um, look at that as an option for a lot of those orthopedic surgeons. So it's an alternative to fusing the ankle. Um, if the ligaments are still in pretty good shape and you're just dealing with uh, bone surfaces that are deteriorating or that have multiple fractures, then an ankle replacement might be indicated. Okay, but you don't see primary osteoarthritis of the ankle that often in people. If they did have that, if they are getting that, it's probably due to a prior injury earlier in life that that cause them to develop degeneration in the joint. Okay. There would be a simple little prosthesis. We don't have one in, in lab to show you, um, but it's pretty small. Uh, however, I, I think the biggest issue with it is that with this total ankle replacement, we just tend to see more non-healing rates in a lot of patients. A lot of that might have to do with circulation, diabetes, that type of stuff. And we'll, we'll talk about those complications, but failure rates are a little bit higher in the ankle replacement than in any other joint that's replaced in the body. Um, the other difference that we see is, you know, think about hip replacement. You've got your precautions, but we want you moving. We want you walking. We want you, for the most part, weight-bearing, unless it's an uncemented approach and they decided to limit weight-bearing. But um, never in any of the hip or the knee replacements do we look at immobilization. But yet in the ankle, a lot of times they have to be non-weight-bearing. Um, some surgeons are doing them where they're allowing some protected weight bearing at first, but more often it's still non weight bearing gait um, that could be for up to several weeks. And then exercise the rest of the extremity. So they're basically immobilized. Don't move that replaced joint. Um, that's a far cry from hip. That's a far cry from knee where we're trying to gain range of motion right off the get go. But once that period of immobilization is there, it would be gentle active range of motion that we're allowed. We'll probably get bumped up to partial weight bearing if we were restricted at first. And then finally we can progress to finally open chain to closed chain once we can get full weight bearing allowed. So, you know, the only issue with that is with the surgeons that still do the non-weight bearing, that is rough for somebody that's older to have to hop around. So the rehab in general takes a lot longer in recovering from a total ankle replacement. Patient will usually, their outcomes include significant pain relief. Um, you know, they were dealing with a very debilitating ankle condition prior to that. You will not get back full range of motion. So you're not going to get back full dorsi, full plantar flexion in a total ankle replacement. Um, unlike your hip and your knee where you get, you know, pretty darn close to full range of motion. Infection 
rates are a little bit higher. Larry talked about the wound healing, sometimes failure of one or both of the components of the ankle replacement can sometimes be complications. So again, it's obviously up and coming. It's certainly done. It's done around the Quad Cities even, I think for at least 10, 12 years now, but it's not one of those surgeries that um, you're going to definitely see a lot of yet. Okay, sometimes what might be best for the ankle is to actually just uh, do a fusion. And so this is usually done with some type of internal fixation along with bone grafting. This might be done when that ankle is very unstable. Uh, again, same idea, multiple fractures that, that would um, indicate having more surgery than just a regular open reduction internal fixation. And then sometimes, unfortunately, for those ankle replacements that don't do well, that fail, Sometimes rather than re-replace the ankle joint, it might be better just to do a fusion of the ankle. So initially, non-weight bearing, immobilized, finally progressed to range of motion and exercise and weight bearing um, as, as allowed by the surgeon. But we might also need to get an orthotist involved after the cast is removed for proper footwear because again, this is not a patient who's gonna end up with very much motion. They may end up with no inversion and eversion to very little of those movements and even dorsiflexion and plantar flexion if they end up with much it might be five ten degrees um, some are done a little bit you know differently than that and they can end up with more but really just depends on what was the reason in the first place as far as how much movement this patient is actually still going to have after their ankle is fused their shell is just a simple way to fuse it with pins um, obviously, in this case, this would primarily affect dorsiflexion and plantar flexion more than anything else, but most of the time your patients that end up with a fusion aren't going to have a whole lot of inversion and eversion either. Okay, on to fractures of the ankle and foot. Um, probably by far the most common in the ankle is going to be some type of fracture of one or both of the uh, malleoli. So you can have a fractured lateral, medial, malleolus, you know, one of those versus both. Both would be called the bimalleolar. Trimalleolar fracture, which sounds funny because we don't have three malleoli in the ankle, but we'd have a bimalleolar, so you got a lateral, and a medial malleolus fracture, and then also part of the posterior tibia margin is also um, fractured. So they actually will call that a trimalleolar fracture. Avulsion fractures, like we talked about in the um, hip and the pelvis, is looking at pulling away a piece of the bone, and probably the most common on that is going to be your Achilles tendon, pulling away a piece of the calcaneus. Treatment for fractures of the ankle and foot is usually going to be, it could either be closed reduction, so in other words, it's a clean fracture, it may just be in a splint for a few days till the swelling goes down and then they'll just cast it, or it could be that they actually have to go in and do an open reduction internal fixation. So a lot of times patients might be in a little holding pattern for the first few days after the fracture because it's too swollen, it's just not ready for um, them to have surgery yet. Okay, they may actually do an ORIF and then put a cast on afterwards, but hands down, probably the most common weight-bearing status, and this is, again, going to be when it involves at least one of the malleoli, it's going to be non-weight-bearing initially. Okay. So they're in that cast, they have to hop around, easy fracture to recover from when you're 22, not easy to recover from when you're 82, for sure. There would be an ORIF. Okay, a medial malleolus fracture. Again, the tibia is the weight-bearing bone here. A lot of times if your patients just have a fibular fracture, not necessarily malleolus, but like a shaft fracture of the fibula, they may be allowed weight-bearing as tolerated at first. Picture on the right shows that avulsion fracture. So the Achilles tendon actually pulls a piece of the calcaneus away. This is usually gonna involve um, for sure, surgery or it will involve immobilization and it's probably going to involve immobilization with the ankle in slight plantar flexion, okay, just to tighten things up a little bit. So you can kind of sense that once these periods of immobilization are over, your job is going to be getting range of motion back for these patients. All right, kind of a sequencing of treatment. I don't think I need to read the, all of that to you guys. Um, most of the time for patients for gait training, though, I do want to mention younger patient can probably do really well if they're non-weight bearing with crutches. Older patients probably going to need a walker. 
Um, how far that person can go really depends on age, prior status. Sometimes your older population with this type of fracture, they're going to end up wheelchair level until they can start weight bearing on it. Once they can get that walking cast and weight bearing is allowed, things progress really nicely for patients too. Okay. Just some miscellaneous fractures that aren't going to be hugely common for us to see all the time, but to make you aware of. A distal tibia compression fracture is also known as a pylon fracture. You can have fractured calcaneus. A lot of times those have to be treated with an open reduction internal fixation. Um, fractured talus stress fractures like we've already talked about and then a jones fracture is a fracture of the fifth metatarsal why it's called a jones fracture i'm not sure but um, for some of these we may not really get much of a referral for these patients until it's time for the boot walking boot or weight bearing status might change and again that a lot of what is going to be weight bearing restrictions will depend on the type of fracture a lot of times if it's going to be open reduction internal fixation versus just putting a walking boot or putting a cast over it a lot of that will really um, just depend on the bone structure and then whether it's a displaced fracture or non-displaced fracture too okay Achilles tendon rupture um, not a fun thing to go through when you have that. We'll be doing a special test in lab known as the Thompson's test. And this is a patient who would have a positive on that test and then no plantar flexion straight, strength whatsoever. Um, now remember with the Achilles tendon, you could have a tear that only affected gastroc, you could have a tear that only affected soleus, or you can have a full tear um, when it comes to that. And, and that we would consider to be a rupture of the Achilles tendon. Two schools of thought on that. You could do non-surgical or you could do surgical. And if it's non-surgical, there's definitely higher rates of re-rupture in those patients. Um, they're usually immobilized for up to two months. And they oftentimes are going to be non-weight bearing. Um, you could do general body conditioning, aerobic exercise. Obviously, for a lot of us for therapy, we're not going to be able to do a whole lot with those patients during a time frame when they are immobilized and so we may discharge from therapy until something changes with weight bearing status and what we're allowed to to work on with the patient okay there'd be an example of the achilles tendon rupture it can rupture throughout just you know in the middle of the tendon it can also rupture more towards the distal insertion on the calcaneus as well but a rupture down here in the distal portion probably is going to end up more of what we would call that avulsion fracture okay so you might not see the tear here but you're going to get that piece of the bone being pulled off and that would be more of an avulsion fracture than the actual rupture of the tendon if a person does go non-surgical, um, I'm going to list there a heel lift in the shoes, modalities. The heel lift, let me go back to that, really kind of helps because they're going to be pretty tight into plantar flexion. And so you try to walk on a normal shoe with, you know, adequate dorsiflexion. You just don't have it yet. So a heel lift might work at first. Um, start simple, isometrics to active, resistive when they're ready for that, definitely proprioceptive and closed chain. You know, even though this might be more of an ankle issue, don't forget about the foot. You had that period of immobilization. You've got to work on foot musculature, strengthening, stretching. Maybe this patient is appropriate for isokinetics if you're getting them back to a sport. Um, again, just depending on patient's age and, and what their lifestyle and um, leisure activity was. When it's repaired surgically, they're still going to have a period of immobilization, but the re-rupture rates are lower. Um, progression is going to be very, very similar. They may have some weight-bearing um, status changes throughout. We just kind of have to follow if there is a protocol or the surgical technique. Um, you know, you've got a lot that you have to get back for these patients, whether it's conservative or post-surgical. They have a lot um, of deficits afterwards. They're limited in range. They're limited in strength. And then when you're rehabbing an athlete, you've got a lot um, to get them back doing so that you can help prevent re-rupture for that patient. Okay. A couple other things would be um, compartment syndrome. Wanted to talk about that a little bit. We can also get a compartment type syndrome in the upper extremity that we'll talk about later this semester. But compartment system is uh, compartment syndrome is strange um, because it can be acute or it can be chronic. Now, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that 
the difference here is that we, we get a lot of elevated tissue pressure, so we're getting this internal swelling, but what can become occluded would be nerve tissue or vascular tissue. And so right away you should realize that if it's an acute situation, this can lead to tissue death. This can lead to necrosis of the lower leg. So when you think about the structures in the lower leg, uh, th you know, think of anterior tibialis all the way back to your posterior musculature, all the way back to your calf muscle. You've got a huge tibia bone. You've got the fibula bone. You've got posterior tibialis. You've got the syndesmotic ligament. You've got lots and lots of structures in a very closed small fascial space. And so when you end up with a trauma, which usually will occur, let's say that a person falls or gets a direct hit onto the, the tibia bone or that type of thing, even burns can sometimes cause that. Um, this can be a very acute condition and you're going to need medical emergency for that patient right from the get-go. I think the strangest case of compartment syndrome in the lower leg that I had ever um, heard of in my life, and this is long before I was a PT, but it was my husband's college roommate was playing football um, one day, got hit in the shin with the football, and thought he just kind of bruised his lower leg. He was in pain. He kind of limped around, you know, probably had a few beers to make the pain go away that night. And then in the middle of the night, just woke up in excruciating, screaming pain with his lower leg um, completely swollen up, um, said that he was feeling numb and just, you know, they knew obviously something was wrong. Ended up in the hospital and had to have surgery for compartment syndrome. So it's one of those things that usually can occur kind of quickly. But in this, you know, in this case, this is an acute condition because it came on very suddenly, even a few hours after the trauma itself happened. So swelling, um, pain, especially with passive stretching, the patient might actually complain of funny feeling, either numbness and tingling, or they might be kind of hyper aesthetic, meaning like they're, they're over feeling, they're very sensitive to touch. Usually a lot of times the skin looks really tense because of the swelling that's going on, uh, very warm, kind of shiny. They need to get help immediately. And so they'll do a fasciotomy um, to prevent any tissue death from occurring. Once they're, they have surgery, we'll probably be involved for a little bit for gait, gentle range of motion, um, progressing to strengthening and flexibility. There are cases though that when people don't get um, help immediately, and, and this isn't treated as a medical emergency, that tissue death will actually occur. And so they may have to have part of muscle tissue removed and things like that because um, tissue death has actually already settled in there. Definitely icing and leg elevation is going to be really, really important for those patients. When it's chronic, um, the swelling isn't quite to the level that it's causing any tissue necrosis, but it could lead to that if left untreated. So they'll complain more of the pain is kind of dull, kind of aching. It's usually only after I go on my long run for the week or, you know, I don't have this pain every day, just on certain days. And so they may actually start having paresthesias as well. But conservatively, a lot of times it can be rest, get that swelling down. They're going to be on some anti-inflammatory agents to help with that strengthen and stretch the involved musculature, but this still could lead to the patient needing a fasciotomy when it comes to um, that chronic compartment syndrome. Okay, the next ones I'll just run through here. These are going to be some of the special tests that we're going to do of the ankle and lab. So anterior drawer test is going to be for ligament sprains. Taylor tilt, inversion and eversion stress, also for ligament sprains, and we'll be able to kind of discern between anterior, posterior, talofibular, or calcaneofibular ligament, or deltoid ligament when you do the Taylor tilt test. And there would be going looking for medial or deltoid ligament. Okay, Holman sign is for a blood clot. We'll go through that in class as well. Thompson's test was for that ruptured Achilles tendon. We'll do that in class. And that's it. So hopefully that helps. We're going to take a quiz on Tuesday over ankle just to kind of see. Hopefully you retained quite a bit from this lecture. And that will give us more time for some cases, doing ankle work, and then being able to prepare for our practical coming up. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.